Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Sophie Smith. I'm the Assistant Director at the York Public Library, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to tonight's program um, about electric vehicles and how they work, how, what they, what's out there, what the infrastructure is like, and how to make them part of your life. We've got three really excellent presenters tonight um, who are going to help us understand this better. We have Harry Musman of York Ready for Climate Action and also from the York um, Energy Steering Committee. Uh, Molly Siegel is here from Efficiency Maine to talk about their involvement in the picture. And then we also have John Gagne here from Maine Clean Communities to talk a little bit about the work that they're doing to increase um, the use and network of EVs throughout the state. Um, I'll let each of our presenters uh, share more information about themselves if they would like um, from a matter of background. But since we have three people talking tonight, I didn't want to overwhelm the uh, introduction with a lot of details. The only last thing I'll mention is I hope that you all join us in two weeks for our next presentation on March 22nd, or 22nd which will be about um, solar, both rooftop community and um, other solar options that might be available to you. But without any further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Harry, who will do the first part of our presentation. Good evening. I'm going to try to share my slides here, and we'll see how that works. So good evening. The title of my talk is On the Road to Driving an EV. Um, and as Sophie mentioned, I've uh, been on the Town of York Energy Steering Committee for quite a few years and recently a director on the York Ready for Climate Action Group. Um, I want to sort of walk through things, uh, what you would think about, what you would do, and all the other issues on uh, uh, moving on to an EV. So why in the world should you transition from your gas vehicle to an electric vehicle? Well, the simple answer is to stop burning gas in your car and reduce your personal greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so each gallon of gas burned releases 19.6 pounds of CO2. And frankly, it adds up. Um, so this picture shows the uh, greenhouse gas emissions for the, uh, the EV that I have, a Nissan LEAF, um, uh, that considers what it provides. And you can see it's uh, fairly low, it's around 100 in this, on this scale. And if you had a, a, a gasoline vehicle about the same, it would be four times higher. So you make a big difference when you do this. And furthermore, as the New England grid uh, becomes cleaner, more renewables, your own EV greenhouse gas emissions will become even smaller. And so that's the point of the whole thing that everybody's uh, considered talking about is beneficial electrification. Transition everything to electricity and transition all electricity to renewables. It can be done. There's been studies to show that, but um, we've got to get going with it. Um, the other reason is, frankly, to reduce the cost of driving and to be immune to gas price spikes. So this chart is one that, that comes from the U.S. Department of Energy. And uh, if you look at the... Um, uh, stacks on the bottom there, you can see that if you if you drive an EV like mine and compare it with a, a, a gasoline car that's getting 25 miles per gallon, um, my yearly cost, monthly, weekly, whatever, is going to be about a quarter, actually about a third of, of what it would be for a gasoline vehicle. And I can tell you, owning an EV now for about six years, um, Barely notice the cost of electricity, and uh, it's a really good deal. For a lot of good reasons, now is a good time to think about purchasing an EV. Uh, first, there's an awful lot of good EVs on the market. More are coming, and most have ranges between two and three hundred miles. And then, the federal government has done a lot. 
the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act, big words, um, have meant that federal investments incentives are way up. And in my references, I have a, an announcement that explains a lot of this stuff. There's billions of dollars that are going to flow into this. And then due to the IRA in particular, the federal government is going to be investing in a massive build out of highway charging stations with what's called the uh, Nevi program. And again, we're going to talk about that a bit later and I imagine Molly will talk about it. So what does Tim Sample say in the efficiency main video? Go the distance in an EV, you can do it. Um, How would you go about doing it? You would start by deciding when and what you need in an EV. When? Probably a good time is when you're ready to retire your gasoline vehicle. Um, otherwise, if you want to start earlier, that's fine, but that's certainly a good time to think about it. You want to make sure that you understand uh, the incentives, particularly the federal tax credits. They're complicated, they keep changing, and you even have to check with an IRS site. Um, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that and maybe Molly will talk about that. You need to decide what you need in an electric vehicle. Is it your second vehicle? Will it be used primarily around town and for regional trips? If so, a smaller EV may, sufficient, may be sufficient, lower cost, and the range won't really be an issue. If this is your only vehicle, and you really need to take longer distance or even long distance trips, then you're going to want an EV with a good range and that can be easily charged on the road. It's more complicated, but it is doable. There's a lot of good information out there. And one of them is a, a website called Plugstar that starts out with a shopping assistant to work you through your vehicle needs. What do you need? What's your budget? What are your driving habits and so forth? And this is a snapshot of their um, top page. Uh, and again, at the end of this talk, I'll, I'll have references and Sophie has indicated we'll, we'll figure out a way to forward them or allow people to pull them down. Um, What I can do based on the Plugstar information is give you a snapshot of popular electric vehicles today. There's a lot of them out there. These are only a small section of them, but there are the most popular ones, I think. You start with smaller size and lower cost. There's a Chevy Bolt EUV. It's, uh, there's a Nissan Leaf, which is the car I own. There are medium-sized cars, Tesla Model 3, VW ID4. <clears throat> there are larger and more expensive cars, Mustang Mach-E and then Tesla Model Y that are definitely SUV-like. And last but not least, which you've probably heard about, there's a pickup truck out now, the Ford F-150 Lightning. And there's a lot more coming in the future. Um, Plugstar also has a vehicle guide to step you through things. And so uh, you have little uh, snapshots of each of these vehicles here. So uh, the Chevy Bolt EV, uh, the Nissan Leaf S are both the lowest cost ones. And, and you know, the Bolt has a range of 247 miles. The Nissan that I'm showing here is more like 150 miles, but there's one with a greater range at a higher cost. But this indicates that, you know, once you consider the incentives and the federal incentives are back in again uh, for every vehicle, um, we're talking under $20,000 for the vehicle. If you go to the Plugstar website, you can then click on each, each of these vehicles and you get a whole range of information. Basic specs, the, the range and, and the battery size, how quickly it accelerates, um, recharging speed for different kinds of chargers, lots of information there. 
Um, again, I can't <clears throat> emphasize more that it's, there's a lot of really good information out there. In what I've called medium-sized vehicles here, um, Volkswagen has a car out, an ID4, and this is the standard one, which is uh, with incentives about 33,000. Then Tesla, of course, which you've probably heard about. There's a Model 3 sedan, regular rear-wheel rear drive, and it get about 35,000. And if you step up in performance with a long range and all-wheel drive, it comes up to 47,000. Um, all these numbers are with incentives. So uh, each of these vehicles that are out there come in multiple flavors. And if you want more range, if you want all-wheel drive, frankly, you're going to pay more. Um, maybe you need it. Maybe you don't. Uh, that's, that's the question that you only you can answer. Um, if we go to something that's somewhat larger, and these are definitely SUV size vehicles, uh, the Mustang Mach-E, the one I've shown here at first is about 38,000. But if you step up with a longer range and maybe uh, you want all wheel drive, this one on the page doesn't have all wheel drive, but we're getting up 40, 50,000 easily. <clears throat> Tesla Model Y is like the Model 3, except it's bigger. It's more SUV-like. The one I've shown here is an all-wheel drive at about $50,000 with incentives. Um, <clears throat> all of these vehicles we've talked about so far get very good ratings when I, when I read um, um, the reviews. <clears throat> Finally, we get to pickup trucks. And you may have heard about the Ford F-150 Lightning. Um, which is amazingly good from every review I've read. The basic model is about 45,000 with incentives, but it goes up and up and up. And there's another one here at 80,000, and there's another one on the Plugstar site of 96,000. Well, pickups can get fancy and they can get expensive. But uh, these are... <laughs> apparently a really, really good vehicle. Uh, they work very, very well. Everybody gives them great ratings. So what you need to do is somehow pick out your electric vehicles of interest, evaluate their availability and the cost, you know. So you need to pick a participating dealer in Maine to get a rebate from Efficiency Maine. And that's paid directly to the dealer. So you, you, it's, it's all taken care of sort of automatically. And the chart here shows that um, the, from the Efficiency Main website, um, a new EV, anywhere from 1,000 to 7,500, depending on various income levels, a new plug-in hybrid from 500 to 3,000. And if you qualify as a low-income uh, family, you can buy a used uh, vehicle and get up to $2,500. So this is really a, a good set of incentives. And again, Molly may say more, but uh, the other action is with available federal tax credits. And this is off the US Department of Energy website. <clears throat> So in many cases, you can get a tax credit of up to $7,500 for new vehicles purchased in 2023. Pre-owned uh, up to 4,000 and purchased back in 2022, for example, you can get a tax credit up to 7,500 in some cases, but it's frankly very complicated. You have to go to the website, you have to look at all the things and you have to verify them with the IRS website. And I, I think you have to be, uh, there's all sorts of new rules coming. And so some things are in and then they're out and then they're back in again. Uh, I really can't say more except follow the references at the end and, and look at things. But it can be pretty good. I did buy my new leaf in 2022 and I just filed my taxes and got a $7,500 credit. Not a bad deal. You need to obviously contact a dealer, 
particularly one in Maine, to check availability and schedule a test drive, calculate the final cost, and make the purchase. I want to give you some personal experience. So in 2017, I purchased a used 2013 Nissan Leaf. It's a limited range, like 100 miles or less, sufficient for what I did. It cost me used about $11,000. Not bad. In 2022, I purchased a new leaf for extended range, more than 200 miles, lots of new safety features, a really nice car. The list is like 39,000, but by the time you take incentives and trade-ins and tax credits, total cost to me was about 22 and a half thousand. Pretty good deal. Starting in 2023, some of these incentives, as we said, can apply to a used electric vehicle. So that's something you could consider. Extra credit. Well, in 2017, I installed a rooftop solar system with a total cost of approximately 20,000 for the solar with its tax credit, a charger, and my EV. Again, a very good deal. You can see the pictures here of the uh, solar panels, the inverter, the charger, and the car. Since then, my greenhouse gas emissions, at least my incremental ones from driving, have been zero. <laughs> Again, uh, it's something you can do once you have an EV. You certainly can't do that with a gasoline car. Um, when you get it home, you've got to charge your EV. And I, the first point here is that most of your charging, like mine, is I think going to be done at home overnight when you're plugged in. Or you might be able to plug in where you work, but we don't have any of that, frankly, in York yet. We're working on it, but not yet. You can start with a, a lower level, level one charger. It's just really a special cord that plugs into a standard 120 volt outlet and plugs into your EV. It adds about five miles per hour, about 40 miles in eight hours, but this may be adequate. For faster charging, you, you move up to what's called a level two charger, special cord from a 240 volt dryer outlet or a box on the wall that's wired to your electrical panel. Um, typically, the outlet or the panel or the box is gonna require installation by an electrician. It's a lot faster, maybe five times faster. You can charge vehicle in your garage or outside. My EV is outside, so I have a box in the garage and a cord that runs under the door and plugs into the vehicle. And the charger may be eligible for tax credit, and I really couldn't, I couldn't come up with a, something definitive when I wrote this, so um, stay tuned. Efficiency Maine has great booklets, and again, Molly may mention this, how to select and install a home vehicle uh, charger and how to charge your electric vehicle at home and away. And these are the pictures. She may show these as well, level one, level two, which are typically things that are done at home. Sometimes level two chargers are available uh, as public chargers. And then along major roads, you find level three chargers, so-called DC fast chargers. And they can add a lot more miles in a fairly short time. Uh, but uh, it, it depends on the charger and on your vehicle. So um, if you want to take a trip, you may be able to complete your trip without charging. Certainly a colleague in, in YRCA uh, has done a 200 mile round trip using an EV, a mock Mustang Mach-E with a 300 mile range, no charging, out and back, no problem. You may be able to plug into a level two charger at your destination, at a hotel or resort. There are some of these in York. Most of them are for Tesla vehicles and they were installed with uh, support from Tesla. But you're gonna typically need to stop uh, at a DC fast charging station to top off on the road. The best coverage to date, bar none, are the Tesla supercharger stations. And currently, they can only be used for Tesla vehicles, although there's some process to opening them up, but I wouldn't hold my breath on that. Most other EVs use the 
what are called CCS compatible charging stations. And as I said, the speed of charging depends greatly on the capability of the station and on your EV. And if you go back, if you look at the PlugStar information, it gives you information on charging speed. Uh, it, again, this can be somewhat complicated, but in many cases you can charge a lot in a half an hour and certainly within an hour. There's charging stations like this, Tesla and others, for example, at the, at the rest sites up in Kennebunk. Um, so here and there, they're all around. And finally, you have to realize that your EV range can and will be reduced if you drive at high speeds or if you need to heat the vehicle on a cold day. Reductions like 20 or 30% are possible. So this is something that people for the moment have to keep in mind and uh, uh, be careful about, frankly. Uh, it's one of the complications of on the road charging, but it isn't insurmountable. So efficiency in Maine has begun expanding level three charging stations on major highways in Maine. And the chart is here. And I assume Molly will talk about that in a moment. Due to the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act, the federal government will be investing in a massive build out of charging stations. The rules say they must be universal, easy to use. And there's a, a program uh, which is planned to put $5 billion of funding in the hands of the states to build on the order of 500,000 EV chargers, over 75,000 miles of highway by 2030. Whew. So it's coming. It really is coming. The money is, uh, is on its way as far as I know. Again, Molly may say more about that. You're going to need to find public charging stations and they include Tesla, ChargePoint, EVgo, and some others. And all of these currently require some sort of an account. Most EVs have onboard apps to help you find available charging stations. And there's a plug share app that allows you to find public parking stations of all types, their capabilities and their current availability. This is a snapshot of, of our area, York and on down to, to Portsmouth. Um, so for example, as I said, there are uh, level three charging stations at the Kennebunk rest stops. In York, it's primarily level two things at, at, at hotels and motels that Tesla put in. In Kittery, there's a level three charging station in one of the uh, parking lots there at the, at the outlets. And in Portland, there's a variety of level two parking stations in the, in the garages, for example. But frankly, they're, they're all over. Uh, I've used the ones at the, at the Portsmouth parking garage. They used to be free, they aren't anymore. So that's the point. You need apps and you need a way of, of connecting uh, the charging to your credit card with the app. Um, and again, the amount that you're charged is a lot more than charging at home, but it can still be worthwhile. Finally, if you need to take trips, but you really don't want to deal with the on the road charging, I would like to suggest you consider purchasing a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle instead of a full EV. Well, EV purists reject plug-in hybrids, but really they're a pragmatic way to avoid range anxiety and trips. They drive on the battery as EVs for a limited range, something like 25 to 40 miles, and then switch to hybrid mode often running at, uh, on gasoline at 50 miles per gallon or maybe a little less. At home, you can plug in with a level one or a level two charger. But again, these have pretty small batteries and a level one charger is often sufficient. Here are two examples, which, uh, so Toyota Prius Prime, um, uh, which has a, an all electric range of about 25 miles and a Toyota RAV4 Prime, which has an all-electric range of about 42 miles. 
And you can see the prices here are quite good. And in fact, uh, in early 2020, uh, for my wife, we bought a Toyota Prius Prime, and that is the car we use for trips. So as long as you plug in uh, plug in hybrid, they can still dramatically reduce your greenhouse gas emissions. So here's a chart from the US Department of Energy um, that assumes 50% electric driving, showing that you've reduced the greenhouse gas emissions by well, down to about a third of what a, a regular vehicle would be. My experience, our experience with the 2020 Prius Prime is a lot better. We do 90% electric driving around town and to Portsmouth. And we had gasoline only for trips. Looking at my accounting for 2022, we spent about total $50 on gasoline. Not too bad. <laughs> That's for the whole year. So I just wanted to end with saying, you know, if and when you begin driving your EV, I think you can feel that you're part of a new era in transportation, and you really are. It is fun to drive. Electric motors are different than gasoline engines. You have instant torque. You just merge into traffic, and it's quiet. It's really nice. You know that you're actually reducing your greenhouse gas emissions. You are not burning any gasoline anymore. And it's a great feeling, frankly, <laughs> somewhat strange at first. Every time you pass a gas station, you say, I don't need to go there anymore. <laughs> um, there's very little maintenance. There's really only tires rotating and occasional things. And there's, you know, with just little things, there's really no need to drop a vehicle at a dealer anymore. Finally, uh, there's a, another little feature that I have on this car. I can set a timer or I can use an app on my phone and I can preheat the, the car in the winter while it's plugged in. So I go out, the car is warm, hop in and take off. Uh, and finally, with an EV, you can now, with rooftop solar, be driving on sunlight. Um, no more oil, no more gas, no more money going out of the state of Maine. Um, so that's my story. Uh, I guess we'll collect questions later. I have references in here, which uh, are, will be available one way or the other. So, Sophie, back to you, I guess. Thank you so much, Harry. Um, so yes, I will make sure that all of the references and slides that Harry put together are located on the climate page on the York Public Library website, where we have the recordings of previous programs, um, both from this year and last year. That will probably be up and online in hopefully tomorrow, maybe Friday, depending on when I can get all the technology to behave. In the meantime, if you have questions, please use the question and answer feature on Zoom to pose your questions, and then we will get to them at the end of the presentation. Um, for now, though, I'll turn it over to Molly from Efficiency Maine to talk about her side of this story. All right, thanks, Sophie. Um, thank you, Harry, for um, that was an awesome and thorough presentation. Um, and I think you really covered a lot of the you know, what people need to know and in going into this. And so I think what I can add here is a little bit more of an introduction to EV charging in Maine. What does the current landscape look like and how might that um, change in the next few years, as Harry mentioned, with all of these new federal investments that are coming in. So um, here we go, I'm gonna get started. Efficiency Maine, um, if you are not familiar with us yet, we run the state's energy efficiency programs. We provide rebates, financing, um, technical and educational resources, and a registry of energy efficiency vendors for um, projects like installing heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, and electric vehicle chargers. Um, our funding comes from various sources, including um, electric ratepayers, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, um, and grants and other sources, including federal funding and state funding. And we have a board that's appointed by the governor and confirmed by the legislature. Uh, my role at Efficiency Maine is I manage the electric vehicle program. So as Harry mentioned, we have a rebate program for electric vehicles, and we also uh, produce educational materials and um, have efforts going to expand public charging infrastructure. 
same graphic that Harry showed you already. So th these are the different levels of charging, level one, two, and three, corresponding with higher power, faster charging speeds, um, and as you might guess, um, more expensive um, equipment and operations. So um, when we're thinking about you know, what you might be installing in your home, it would likely be a level two charger, or you might use 120 volt, what we call a level one charger that's already in place. Um, so I keep going. This is a snapshot of what the current EV charging infrastructure looks like in Maine as of January. So this is growing every day. We're seeing new charging stations going in um, all around the state. Some of these are funded by Efficiency Maine and some of these are not. A lot of businesses are putting these in uh, as a way to attract customers and to improve the experience uh, of people that are visiting their business. We live next to some states that have a lot more EVs than we do in Maine. And as we know, Maine gets a lot of tourist traffic from those states. So a lot of businesses are thinking, you know, it, it might be worthwhile for me to be able to serve those drivers. Uh, this map shows some of the distribution around the state of where the level two chargers are, which those are the blue circles. The level three or DC fast chargers are the uh, sort of reddish orange circles. Um, and you can see the ones that are open in the middle are um, under construction right now. There's actually one in Newport uh, right up here that was just turned on a couple weeks ago. So that is now a go. We have another station in Bangor that's coming online within a couple of weeks. So things are moving pretty quickly. And um, within the next couple of years, people should be able to drive from north to south and from east to west across the state without being worried about finding a place to charge um, on the highway. As Harry mentioned, the vast majority of charging, if you're an EV driver, is probably going to be done at your house while you sleep, um, which is really convenient and nice because it means that you don't have to worry about that sort of gas station model of fueling. But if you're like most people and you go on road trips occasionally, you want to have that certainty that you'll be able to find a place to charge. So um, within the next couple of years, on all of these key routes that you can see highlighted in yellow, there should be um, fast charging stations every 50 miles or less. That's a goal that has been set by us as a state, and it's also a goal that the federal government is targeting with all of those new funds. So you can keep that in your in your head as sort of, you know, when I set out for a road trip, um, once this investment is all, uh, once these stations are built, should be able to find a place to quick charge, fast charge every 50 miles. Um, a couple of ways that you can find public chargers. Um, one way is on our website, we have this charging station locator. So if you're curious and you wanna take some time to explore around and see you know, some common places that you might visit, are there chargers nearby? You can look here. Um, there are also a number of apps called, uh, apps and websites, PlugShare, ChargePoint, EVgo. We have this list on our website as well. If you use smartphones, you can do it that way. If you're someone that likes to plan ahead on your computer at home and then maybe print out some station locations, you can also do that. And a lot of the cars um, have this built-in software where they can locate stations for you while you're on the road. So that can be pretty nifty. I know a lot of EV drivers like to use that functionality because it's built right into the car. All right, um, we have some videos about this. So I'm gonna try to share uh, a couple of moments from this one video and I'm just gonna make sure that I can share sound. All right, so this is Tim Sample in one of our charging videos. Hi, Lindsay. Hi, Dan. Yeah, I, I figure I got enough juice to make it home, but I found these uh, charges right at the supermarket, and I figured why not top up uh, while I'm shopping? Good idea, Dad. You'll often see these level two chargers at places like this, where you can leave your car plugged in while you go about your business. Let's walk through it together. It's super easy. First, make sure the car is turned off and open the charge port lid like we did at home. Okay, the car's off and the port's open. You'll have to pay in many public chargers, but it still costs a lot less to run an EV car than a gas car. 
Do you see a screen with any instructions? Yeah, it says uh, I can use my card or the app on my phone. Now, that's the one we downloaded together, right? Exactly. You can start the charge and pay directly through your smartphone. It'll show you how much electricity you're getting and what it costs. You'll even be able to track how many miles of range you're adding while you shop. Well, it sounds pretty simple, but what if my cell phone's not working? There's no uh, coverage in the area. There's lots of ways to pay, Dad. If you don't have your phone, most chargers will also work with a swipe card that they send you in the mail. Or if you did have your phone but no app or swipe card, you can call a toll-free number and pay with your credit card. Yep, got my phone on. Looks like the charger's all ready. Great. Now grab the connector handle from the station and line it up with the port in the car. Plug it in until you feel it latch. When the little... All right. Um, so Tim goes on and, and explains all about how to use public chargers and um, charging at home, charging away from home. So you can find those all at efficiencymain.com. Light stops Oops. flashing and stays lit. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what um, some of our initiatives are to expand public charging. So looking towards the future. Um, what can we expect? So the state of Maine, um, we are a quasi state agency. We work with other state agencies in Maine on um, the statewide EV infrastructure plan. So we have a plan that was submitted by Maine DOT. They submitted it to the Federal Highway Administration and it identifies some of the goals and priorities for expanding charging infrastructure in Maine. So this is a public policy document that is guiding the state's investments in charging infrastructure. Um, which are mainly funded by federal funds. This is a snapshot of um, some of the planned or all of the planned DC fast charging locations that should be coming online within the next five years or so. Um, so this is just gives you a visual of, um, you know, if you remember that map before that showed the existing stations, actually this map shows it. The green and yellow dots are the existing um, fast charging stations currently. And once we are able to implement all of these federal investments, um, this is what the, the map will look like. So it is a substantial build out, substantial investment, um, and will make it a lot easier to drive an electric vehicle in Maine. Most of these charging stations will be located on key travel corridors. However, we know there are also some destinations in Maine where people visit such as Rangeley uh, or Greenville or um, Millinocket that are not located on one of those travel corridors and will also uh, be places that people are going to need to charge. So that's also factored into the plan. Um, we have funding opportunities out there right now for commercial um, chargers. So we have a funding opportunity notice for level two chargers at rural areas in Cumberland and York counties. So that's this top bullet uh, FON uh, 002 2023. It provides up to $8,000 per port per charging plug uh, for local governments and libraries, and then $5,000 per port for businesses. So this is applicable to your area right now. If any of you um, know of a commercial property owner, business owner, or a governmental entity that's looking to put in chargers to serve the public, uh, this funding is available. The due date is uh, the end of June. We also have um, a round of funding going out for fast charging later this month. Um, and so that will be the first step in this federal investment in the, the National EV Infrastructure uh, Program. So we are starting to put those that funding out in the streets with the hope of getting some projects um, underway within the next year or so. And then we do also offer rebates um, for governmental entities that buy EVs so they can also get a rebate on a vehicle to charge uh, on a charger to charge that vehicle. Okay, I'm gonna keep moving pretty quickly. Harry talked about some of the resources we have. I just wanted to mention, we do have rebates for EVs. That's already been covered. We have lots of different resources on our website. Uh, these charging guides, we have two guidebooks for drivers and then one for public charging station hosts. You can find those on our website and you can also order a hard copy by calling Efficiency Main um, at our toll free number. We have videos, um, so go check it out if you want to spend some time, learn a little bit more about what it's like to drive an EV in Maine. 
And then this is our contact information. Give us a call or an email and we're happy to help if you have more questions. Thank you so much, Molly. That's really great. And I see all the questions coming into the Q&A, so we will get to those when we get to the end of the presentation. But before we do that, I want to pass it over to John Gagne, who's going to tell us more about Maine Clean Communities and how that fits into the picture as well. Yeah, let me pull my slides up. Okay. Well, thank you everybody um, for having us. This has been really great, especially hearing from Harry and Molly. Um, very great thorough presentations. Harry covered the a lot of the EV stuff. Molly covered the charging. So naturally, we're um, one of the programs that does a lot of work with EV deployment and development in the state of Maine. Um, so my name is John Gagne. I am the Sustainability Program Coordinator at the Greater Portland Council of Governments. And through the Greater Portland Council of Governments, we host um, the Maine Clean Communities Coalition, which is part of the Clean Cities Organization. Before I get to that, um, I will introduce the team. So it's just uh, me and one other person, uh, me and Sarah Mills Knapp, who is the Director of Sustainability at the Greater Portland Council of Governments. Um, and then there's me. Um, so the Greater Portland Council of Governments is a regional um, organization in nature, but our main communities program does operate statewide. So I would like to give a little background on what Clean Cities as an organization is. Um, so the Clean Cities Network is a U.S. Department of Energy program comprised of local coalitions working with communities across the country to implement alternative fuels, fuel saving technologies and practices and exploring new mobility choices. So as you can see on the map, there are a lot of Clean Cities coalitions across the country. Many states have one um, and several states have many. Um, so a little fun fact about the Clean Cities organization and its impact. Um, so more than 83% of the U.S. population lives inside a Clean Cities coalition boundary. Um, so the Clean Cities coalitions are an active and diverse network of nearly 18,000 stakeholders, which are comprised of government agencies, industry representatives, community organizations, and businesses, um, and all working together through the Clean Cities organization to exchange information and resources. So 39% of these stakeholders come from the private sector, um, but surprisingly 61% um, represent the public sector. So through our collective efforts, we are transforming local and regional transportation markets. Um, and each coalition is led by a director that is sort of the boots on the ground. Um, so they work directly with our stakeholders um, and serve as both an educator and a problem solver. Um, and coalitions are locally based with access to national resources. So this is where clean communities um, and the clean cities organization as a whole um, really shines. So, you know, the, the organization is really great at making meaningful and impactful connections. So clean cities coalitions provide assistance, information and resources to successfully plan and execute alternative fuel vehicle and fueling infrastructure projects whether that project is providing technical assistance for on the ground um, work, making connections to various funding opportunities or facilitating local and national partnerships. Um, and these activities combined with an access of information, technical assistance, funding and project planning makes Clean Cities the successful program that it is today. So, you know, we've got this broader network of clean cities organizations, um, and then Maine Clean Communities is sort of Maine's Clean Cities uh, Coalition. Um, so this coalition is part of the U.S. Department of Energy program, uh, but like I said before, is housed within the Greater Portland Council of Governments. Um, and we've been working with stakeholders across the state and across uh, a wide variety of stakeholder industries um, for the past 25 years to help them adopt alternative fuel technologies. Um, so we really have um, one mission um, and it's stayed pretty consistent um, over the last several years. 
um, and it's to work to expand the use of alternative fuels, domestically produced transportation fuels, and energy efficient vehicle technologies. So, you know, traditionally, Clean Cities has been um, known as fuel agnostic, uh, but with the current administration and the priorities of the state, um, our main focus uh, here in Maine has been on primarily electric vehicles. And so each Clean Cities coalition has this, these two main goals. Um, so it's to uh, the di displacement of uh, gasoline gallons equivalent uh, by 16% every year and improve greenhouse gas emissions reductions by 20% every year. So all Clean Cities coalitions uh, have a very wide and diverse group of stakeholders that are part of the coalition. Um, ours is no different. So you can see here um, we have connected with uh, utilities, transit agencies, fuel providers, municipalities, private entities, state fleets, uh, you name it, we've probably talked with them. Um, we deal with anything and everything, alternative fuels and transportation. Um, and so, you know, this really brings to the question of why our coalition um, is needed in the state and, you know, how we can make an impact. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you are familiar, but in 2020, the state of Maine released its first climate action plan, Maine Won't Wait. Um, this plan lays out a variety of goals and objectives necessary to make Maine uh, more resilient to the hazards and impacts of climate change. So when the plan was initially released, it was identified that 54% of all emissions came from the transportation sector. And so at the same time, uh, Maine has also set a target of reducing overall state greenhouse gas emissions by 45% by 2030 and 80% by 2050. So 54% of emissions coming from the transportation sector, um, you know, that, that made uh, transportation kind of uh, front and foremost for a lot of um, fleets and organizations to decarbonize. So because of that, Maine identified the climate goal of having 219,000 electric vehicles on the road by 2030. Um, so, you know, we've got a long ways to go, but uh, great groups like this and state agencies and various stakeholders across the state of Maine are working to make that happen. Um, so the state of Maine released an update on their climate action plan at the end of 2022. Uh, the transportation sector is now responsible for 49% of all emissions, so a 5% uh, decrease, which is great. Um, and we now have 8,600 light duty vehicles on the road. So we've still got a ways to go, but we're chugging along. Um, so, you know, this really brings the question of how Maine clean communities can fit into communities existing climate action work. So a lot of Southern Maine communities right now, and even in the mid coast and central Maine are starting to conduct their own climate action plans. And part of this climate action plan usually involves a greenhouse gas, em em gas emissions inventory. Um, and transportation tends to be a large sector um, in each community. So um, one of the things that we can help provide with communities as they're going through this process or trying to make plans for their climate action plan or set priorities um, is provide technical assistance on emissions reduction strategies throughout the, the climate action planning process. Um, we work with transportation planners um, to do some alternative fuel vehicle adoption planning. We can do fleet analysis, which looks at um, vehicle ownership costs, uh, cost comparison of fuel. We can look at the duty cycle of vehicles. Um, we can get pretty in depth with it. Um, and then we also do work with alternative fuel vehicle infrastructure um, development. Um, and then, you know, we also specialize in community engagement, like I said before, doing um, really fun events like this. Um, and then I'll give some examples of some more events that we've done in the past. So because the Clean Cities organization is, is tapped into this national network of Clean Cities coalitions um, across the country, we have access to a lot of uh, technical resources and educational resources um, that we really like to share with our communities and stakeholders. And so I wanted to share these two examples of some bigger projects that our coalition has done in the past few years. 
Um, so Maine Clean Communities has partnered with Vermont and New Hampshire Clean Cities Coalitions um, to do this medium and heavy duty uh, EV webinar series. So it addresses the challenges and showcases solutions for a lot of the larger vehicles that are harder to replace, but maybe um, larger carbon emitters. Um, the other one that we have done um, is a municipal EV toolkit, which helps communities looking to transition their fleets um, and adopt electric vehicles and install EV charging station. This also has an example of uh, zoning and ordinance guides, um, permitting and inspections, and examples of how to be a leader in this space. Our coalition is really big on community engagement opportunities. Um, so some examples of uh, community engagement efforts that we've done over the past few years are vehicle demonstrations. So in the top right there, um, our coalition actually hosted one of the first electric school bus demos in the state. Um, one of the communities um, in Northern Maine was getting their first electric school bus. Um, it was really exciting. It was passing through Southern Maine. So we held an event in Scarborough. Um, so community members could come and see, you know, the benefits of a zero emissions bus um, and the performance of it. Um, and it was really fun and great time. Um, so we love engaging with communities um, to showcase these new technologies. We also do a lot of EV ride and drive events. Um, so we've done events in Wells, we've done them in Portland. Um, as in the bottom right, there's our intern actually at the Green Home and Expo show last year um, with our uh, company EV, which is really cool that we have that. Um, so we bring it to a bunch of EV ride and drive events. Um, give community members an opportunity to test drive an EV, um, and then we'll do ride-alongs with you to answer any questions along the way. It's a really great way to engage um, with community members and give them a chance to have a hands-on feel um, and talk to some EV owners. We also have an EV lending program, uh, the Greater Portland Council of Governments, um, with our Kia Nira there. Um, where we actually allow members of the public to borrow the electric vehicle for up to five days at a time. Um, and this is really an effort that we were leading to give members of the public, um, you know, an opportunity to see what EV ownership is like. You know, some people might allow you to borrow an EV overnight, or, you know, you might even be lucky to find an EV. Um, but this gives people an opportunity to see how charging would fit in their day-to-day -day schedule. Um, and so, you know, we've had several people from the past um, coordinate with myself to, to borrow it for up to a week. And, you know, we've heard nothing but really great experiences. Um, so if that is something that you're interested in, you can take my contact information at the end um, and we can look at scheduling that. We also host the Drive Electric Main stakeholder meeting, which is stakeholders across the state who regularly meet once a quarter to discuss EV um, development opportunities um, across the state of Maine. Um, we're actually meeting tomorrow uh, afternoon, which is really exciting. Um, and then we also attend various climate conferences across the state to do exactly what we're doing here today and talk about the work that we do and, and share some information about EV development. And then I just wanted to quickly highlight a project that we are currently working on and we have funding um, to do across the state right now, and that's called the Empower Project. Um, this is really exciting because this is a specifically workplace focused um, charging project where we're engaging with workplaces across the state of Maine um, to install EV charging stations. So this is a, a national project with 30 other clean cities coalitions across the country doing the same exact work in their state. And this project is really aimed um, at creating a more accessible EV charging network. You know, like Harry and Molly said, the majority of people will charge their EVs at home, but you know, there's still a large population of folks living in urban areas um, that rent and do not have access to install a charging at home. 
Um, so one of the solutions for that is to ensure that people's workplaces have um, charging stations and that way, um, you know, people who don't have the opportunity to charge at home can do so at their workplace. Um, this project also follows the Justice 40 initiative, um, which is the first one of the first federally funded workplace charging program um, that is really aimed um, at addressing equity concerns with EV charging. Um, so, you know, this is kind of an overview of how Maine Clean Communities plays a role in this and how we can help. So, you know, we can help you identify funding opportunities, um, whether it's through Efficiency Maine or federally sourced. Um, we can help coordinate with utilities. CMP is our partner. We also are, um, we also have relationships with other utilities across the state. Um, we can provide technical assistance throughout the process, um, and then you're also becoming part of this larger network of workplaces across the country doing similar work. Um, so if you are a business owner or know a business that would be interested in this, please send them our way. We are looking to sign up um, at least 30 businesses across the state. Um, and then I'll, I'll go through these quick um, since Molly touched on some of these already, but um, the Alternative Fuel Data Center is a really great resource that Clean Cities coalitions work very closely with um, to help provide data um, and then communicate its resources to stakeholders. So Harry talked a bit about the uh, Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and Inflation Reduction Act. Um, it's a mouthful. There's a lot of information. Um, and it's hard to follow. Um, so the Alternative Fuel Data Center definitely does a really great job at outlining all available funding resources. Um, they have policy um, analysts on team um, and a lot of great connections with the federal government. So that's always one of the, the great places um, to stay updated with that. Um, also, if you're curious about the uh, EV tax credit, which I know many people are who are looking at buying an EV, there's actually a comprehensive list right there at the bottom of all EVs that qualify um, for the assembled in North America requirement. <laughs> uh, sorry to repeat this, um, but this is a great resource for finding uh, EV charging stations across the state of Maine. Um, there are several um, resources that people utilize on a day-to-day -day basis. PlugShare is one of my favorites, um, but there are many out there. Uh, so you, you know exactly where you're going and, and where to charge when you get there. And then sort of this last thing, um, Clean Cities Coalitions have access to these really great response services and technical assistance teams. Um, that specifically help Clean Cities coalitions and their stakeholders. Um, so if you have any technical questions, um, especially if it's related to any of the upcoming policies, any funding resources, um, if you're on a committee and you're interested in adopting an EV zoning ordinance, um, anything that it could be that you can think of, um, you can either send it through us and we can um, get that answer for you, or you can contact um, this technical response service directly. Um, and like that's everything that I have. Um, wanted to keep it nice and quick so we have time for questions. Um, but if anyone would like to get in touch after, this is our contact information. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. That was really informative and a whole sort of different side of the picture. All right, so there are a pile of questions that I am going to, I guess, take in order because that seems like the most efficient way to do it. Um, I'm going to ask about where this would be located after the recording goes up. So all of the um, past recordings will be on yorkpubliclibrary.org slash climate, where you can find all the events that we posted um, and uh, review them at your own pace and pause and look at all the slides. And I'll also upload any files that I have um, at the same place. Um, someone has a question here about, uh, we know that the heating the car decreases its efficiency. Are there any alternative heating methods being explored, I guess, for cars? Um, <clears throat> so this is Harry. Uh, there aren't really alternative methods, but, 
uh, heating a car has a couple of things going on. Number one, you heat the air either with a, an electric resistance heater or some cars have a heat pump. And uh, again, the heat pump does air conditioning in the summer and heating the car in the winter. And particularly at higher temperatures, it's a lot more efficient than resistance heating. So in that respect, it depends upon the, uh, whether the car is equipped with a heat pump or not. The other thing is a lot of EVs, like my LEAF, are equipped with heated seats and a heated steering wheel. So um, in that case, you can sort of get by with less heat in the, in the vehicle itself. Um, uh, and, um, and as I said, uh, with an EV, you can typically set a timer or an, use an app to get the car warm before you take off in the morning. So. Um, for a lot of my local trips, the car is toasty warm when I leave. You don't really need to add a lot of heat, and it's, it's okay. On the road, it, it can be a, a drain, and I have a chart, which I could, I suppose, forward, where people have tested different vehicles and show the, the reduction when you go from 70 degrees down to, let's say, 30 degrees. Um, I'll try to forward that. I'll find that chart and try to forward it. Thank you. Um, here's a question. Uh, what's the cost for charging at a level two or level three charger for, you know, Harry, I don't know if you can give an example from your car or if there's sort of like a default rate that's um, used. Maybe Molly could answer that better than I can. I, I don't pay much. <laughs> yeah, just some ballpark numbers I can give. Um, so for a DC fast charger, which tend to be more expensive than the level twos, um, if you're charging a full battery, you might pay about $26. It's pretty rare that you would charge from empty to full on a DC fast charger. So just keep that in mind. Um, versus at home, um, you might pay about $13 for that same amount of charge. So it's about twice as expensive to charge on a fast charger than it is to charge at your home. Great, thank you. Um, so here's a question. How does Maine plan to meet the demands of charging the charging demands of low rural, low and moderate income residents? Yeah, that's a great question. So a lot of the current initiatives we have out there are for rural areas. So the level two charging funding opportunity we have now is for rural areas. We just closed out a round where we awarded 55 projects in rural areas in the rest of the state, the Northern um, regions. And then a big part of the state's EV plan is um, charging to serve people that live in areas with a high density of multifamily housing. So whether that is at the multifamily parking lots or on the street, um, just in areas with that high density, that will help to serve people that don't have a garage or a driveway. Um, so yes, there, there is a lot of emphasis in the state's plans on rural and low to moderate income people, folks that face higher barriers to EV adoption. Thank you. Um, here's a question, a business question. If you have a business and want to install a charger for others to use, what permits are required and where do businesses get the info to do that? That might fall within John's uh, initiative. I don't know. Um, every town has a different permitting process, which, you know, makes it a little bit more challenging. Um, so, you know, you have to, you do have to check, um, it is town by town. So check with your town permitting office and your, your permitting off code officials. Um, they would have a better idea of what specifically would be required um, of York residents. Unfortunately, I don't, I don't know for York um, here, but yeah, you can, you can find that information directly with the town. I would also say, ask your electrician. Um, if they're installing the charger for you, they know how to pull permits and they are the ones that should be able to get that information. Yeah. That's a really good tip. And I can also try to get in touch with someone from Town Hall to find out your specific information to add a, an addendum later. Um, there's a note here about it being good to target travelers who visit the state, but what about all the those of us who are stuck here year round, and you know, um, I think that's more of a general comment, probably about uh, you know, sort of where things are focused. Um, but I, I think you've kind of answered that. Unless you have anything else to say, 
Um, yep, no, absolutely. Year-round residents could could use these chargers as well. There's no no restriction on who can use them. Okay. Um, there's a question here about the library getting charging stations, and um, I would say that we would very much like to. And we had a um, we had funding in place pre-pandemic that had to sort of take a, a side train um, in early 2020 as we we're figuring things out. And right now we're engaging with a lot of different um, energy projects for our li library as a whole, and EV charging is part of that. So I anticipate having more information about that in the coming months, hopefully. Um, all right, no question. Are the electric utilities such as CMP involved in the build out of the EV charging stations? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if you're a business or a commercial property that chooses to install chargers, uh, it's likely that you will interact with your utility with CMP um, if they have to upgrade your electrical service or install a new electrical service. Um, they are a key part in that process. So typically it's the electrician that, that will be engaging with the utilities, but sometimes you um, might be doing that as well. I also want to put in a quick plug here. If there's a lot of questions about business and commercial chargers, we actually have an upcoming webinar from Efficiency Maine where we're going to go deeper into these topics. So I believe it's on April 3rd, um, Monday, April 3rd. So if you want to ask more questions about, about these topics, um, please join us there. All right, um, a question about the sourcing for the power for that feeds the charging stations. Um, is there any um, consistency on where that power source comes from or if it's from a power plant or a solar farm or elsewhere? You know, it, it comes from um, whoever supplies your electricity in the grid. I will say that Maine has a relatively clean electricity grid. A lot of it comes from hydropower. More and more communities now are installing solar. Um, so, you know, as time goes on, we're producing more and more clean energy. Um, you know, we have seen a lot of charging stations um, being integrated specifically with solar, um, or if, you know, it's at a residential unit that has solar, um, you know, that would change the mix up of where your electricity is being sourced. Um, but, you know, it, it, again, can kind of depend a bit. Yeah, that's a complicated one. Um, all right, some other questions. Um, are all EVs and hybrid plugins able to charge at level three stations? That's for Harry. Um, yeah, so yes, they are, as far as I know. Um, but there are different um, level three connector arrangements. Um, so the vast majority of, of vehicles, other than Tesla, uses so called CCS combined. And maybe I can forward a, a a drawing of this at some point. Um, a few cars like my Leaf follow an older Japanese standard, uh, which is not very popular. And Tesla has their own standard, which is um, at the moment not compatible with anything. So it's by and large, it's either Tesla or the CCS standard. Um, if you went to the Kennebunk service area, you'd find five Tesla chargers using the Tesla interface. And I think there are there are charge point chargers with maybe four interfaces that probably do CCS and maybe the Japanese standard, I don't know. So <clears throat> the new federal standards and Molly would, would understand this too, say whatever is going to be installed has to be universal, whatever that means. It has to serve any vehicle that pulls up. Um, most likely that's going to be the CCS standard. And Tesla has made a, an adapter that converts CCS into charging a Tesla vehicle. So that, that's one solution. Uh, Tesla superchargers may in some cases be equipped with CCS cords. Supposedly that started, I wouldn't hold my breath on that. Molly, what do you know? Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I just wanna, 
offer one clarification to the question. So all full EVs, all battery electric vehicles can use level three or DC fast charging stations. Most plug-in hybrids cannot. So if you have a plug-in hybrid, you cannot use a DC fast charger, but if you have a full EV, you can. Yep. All right, it sounds about as clear as phone chargers these days, which, you know, which one's working with whose device. Um, there's a question here about incentives that might be available in New Hampshire. Um, that might be, I, I don't know if anyone happens to know. Um, so I could actually connect you with the our Clean Cities counterpart in New Hampshire to answer all New Hampshire based questions for you. <laughs> so I can pass along their contact information if you're interested. That would be great. We're sort of on the line uh, line here. So it's always good to know sort of what both states have to offer. Um, and then the third question is sort of what is a, a general rule of thumb for setting a rate if you are in a position of putting in a commercial charger? Um, is there a, a standard that's kept or is that individually left up to businesses? It, it, it very much is up to the owner. There's no rule of thumb, unfortunately, and it's a complicated topic and it's something that we will go into in our webinars on commercial charging. So I probably don't have time to go into it today, but yeah, it depends on a lot of different factors, mostly what your costs are for running the charging station. But if you go to plugshare.com, you can see what some of the um, variety is of what stations are charging around the state. All right, here is a good one. Um, what happens if you run out of battery power when you're on the road? Does AAA have a portable backup source to help you out? They're starting to, yeah. Um, that's one of the really cool things I saw um, late last year or it was early this year. Um, you know, AAA is known for their roadside assistance. Um, and so they're starting to develop um, this new system to assist drivers who are stranded on the road. Um, you know, there are portable charging options that are available that you can um, hook on the back of a trailer. Um, I don't know that there are any large scale popularized ones um, here in the state of Maine yet, unfortunately. Um, I don't know if you've heard of any Molly that exist, but there are some that are coming. Yeah, that, that covers it. Okay. Um, almost everybody needs a car. Are there any examples of programs helping folks with lower incomes get an EV or hybrid, like a Habitat Humanity model for EVs? Yeah, so uh, our rebates are scaled by income. So if somebody qualifies as low income, which means they are participating in uh, DHHS programs, so Main Care, SNAP, TANF, uh, they can get the highest level of rebate. Um, that's what I'm aware of. I'm not aware of any other programs in the state um, aimed at helping folks get into a, a different vehicle. Yeah, that's so Molly, some of the incentives are available now for used EVs, right? So that, that's that correct. might yep. help. So that might help a person get into the um, EV world without spending as much money as for a new car, right? Right. Okay. Um, what's the fuel generation mix in Maine required to charge electric vehicles? I'm not, I don't under that, understand that question clearly myself, but I don't know all of this. So maybe hopefully you guys do. If not, maybe the respondent could clarify. Yeah. So, so there, uh, it, when you get electricity in Maine, uh, it's really in the, the whole New England grid. It's not just Maine. <laughs> it's okay. And the whole New England grid has a certain uh, percentage of, of renewables and so forth. It's pretty high. And it's intended to go higher uh, as time goes on. So um, uh, by and large, the New England grid is pretty clean. And I have the numbers, but I don't have them in front of me. Um, there, it's certainly a lot greener than, say, the Midwest, where there's a lot of uh, coal still being burned to produce electricity. We're in pretty good shape, and we're supposed to get better as time goes on. Um, <clears throat> I can find the number and forward it. 
great John, question. I don't know. Do you, oh, do you mind? I think John answered this question earlier with the, it's a mix of sources in Maine. All right, I'm noticing the time has gotten away from me. So I'm gonna have one more question here. Um, and I think this is a good one. Um, as more and more folks have EV, is there a protocol or etiquette for queuing up to using public charging stations? Um, you know, like, is that, is that something that like an app manages? Is there sort of a general, you know, like process? You know how to do, I know how to do it at the gas station. I've never thought about it at a, an EV <laughs> charging station. Um, a couple of things. Yeah, so a lot of the apps will show you which stations are in use. So if you're on the road and you're approaching a charging station, uh, it will show you, you know, there's say four chargers at the station and one of them is in use. Um, that real time information is typically available um, for you. And uh, the question about sort of queuing up, some networks do allow you to make reservations to use the charging station. Uh, that's not universally available, but I know that that's particularly in, in busy areas that is available on some of the apps. I'll also say some communities are electing to adopt parking limits. Um, so how long you can park at a charging station. Um, and if it is a network charger, some people are electing to instill a fee. Um, if you are plugged in for longer than your allotted time as a way to dissuade people from just sitting at a charger all day um, doing whatever they're doing. <laughs> So there, there are some workarounds around it um, and some things being put in place to dissuade people from um, taking up a parking spot when they're not actually charging. Great, thank you. Um, it is almost 8.20, so I, wa I wanna really appreciate all of the time that the three of you have given us tonight to go into all of the nitty gritty of, of EVs and how they work now, how they're going to work in the future, and some of the, the growth potential that's here, because I really do think that there's a whole lot of, um, the future is very bright here. Um, and I will be posting the recording of this, as well as any resources that I have in the next couple of days. Um, but in the meantime, I just wanted to thank all of you, John, Molly, Harry, thank you so much for your time this evening. Uh, it was a really valuable presentation. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Have a good day, everyone. Bye.